Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog, RichardDwyer.co. Today is May 24th, 2021. Let's talk about one of the weakest parts of the Warren Commission. Let me also express my belief that as we continue to have technology evolve, as the everyday average American gets access to more and more information and information capability, right, databases where we can actually read through hundreds of pages of transcripts on the Kennedy assassination, where we can look at countless articles on the Kennedy assassination from the comfort of our homes without going to a library, which is something American citizens in the mid-1960s did not have the opportunity to do as easily and as conveniently as we can do so via our computers today. Let me just say that I do not believe that the Warren Commission's findings, even the suggestion that the Warren Commission was thorough in their approach, would hold water today. I believe today, because of the resources we have, we have much higher standards. I also believe the culture is a bit different, right? Millions of people watch true crime shows on television. You have more than one true crime channel. There are several true crime podcasts out there. I believe we've come to learn about the importance of chain of custody. That if it's broken, if there's a weak link, then you're going to have problems. So, what I want to do is to give a disclaimer I believe researching the Kennedy assassination is extremely important, especially since I have a five-year-old daughter, and as she grows older, I want her to have an accurate reading of history, and I want her to question things that, quite frankly, aren't supported by the evidence. So let's talk about the discovery of the magic bullet at Parkland Hospital. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now anyone who has watched trials on Court TV or has watched Investigation Discovery Network or Oxygen Network understands that the prosecution has to prove that the evidence in their possession is connected to the defendant. Right? If there's a question, if there is murkiness, if there's uncertainty, then you simply cannot meet the beyond a reasonable doubt legal standard for finding a defendant guilty. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to, for the historical researchers among us, direct people's attention to a specific portion of the Warren Commission. Findings, right? Record. It's volume 6, pages 130 to 133. Again, volume 6. Pages 130 to 133. Now, the person who spotted the magic bullet on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital was named Daryl Tomlinson. Right? He was a engineer, they call him at the hospital. Other places refer to him as a maintenance worker at the hospital. Now here's what's important. 
they interview him in the pages of the Warren Commission literature that I've just cited. And apparently he was dealing with two different stretchers by his own admission. We'll call them Stretcher A and Stretcher B. Now, I want you to think in terms of percentages, right? 100% would be a clear identification of the stretcher on which he found CE399, the bullet we're calling the magic bullet. Right, folks, it's one of the most important pieces of evidence in the JFK investigation. Understand how important it is. Governor Connolly in the car with JFK does not believe that he was hit by the same bullet as President Kennedy, nor does his wife who was also in the car, right? I know there are people out there using phrases such as, cons you know, conspiracy theorists and stuff like that. Just to understand, we're just going to follow wherever the evidence takes us, right? Governor Connolly does not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. He bases that belief on not only his injuries, but on what he heard. If you look at the film of them in the car, and I understand people are going to talk about jump seats and angles, but it's clear that he's holding his hat and his hand is over here. When Kennedy is hit in the throat and we're supposed to somehow believe that the bullet enters Conley, Right? And ends up smashing his wrist. The sequence doesn't work, as Cyril Wett has pointed out. When you look at the film itself. Well, we're not even focusing on the film here. We're just focusing on the discovery of the bullet. Understand, it's the prosecution's burden to link that bullet to defendant Lee Harvey Oswald. So at Parkland, Daryl Tomlinson is dealing with two stretchers. We'll call them stretcher A and stretcher B. One stretcher is likely the stretcher that was used for Governor Connolly, right, to wheel him into his surgery. The other stretcher has no bearing whatsoever on the presidential assassination. Now, from the questioning, it's clear from the citation I gave you to the Warren Commission records. Again, it's volume six, pages 130 to 133. Arlen Specter is questioning Daryl Tomlinson, the person who found a bullet that's been referred to in folklore as the pristine bullet on a stretcher at Parkland, right? It's clear from the questioning that Arlen Specter was hoping that Daryl Tomlinson would identify stretcher B as the stretcher on which he found the magic bullet. Would it shock you to learn that Tomlinson actually identifies stretcher A, then says he's really not sure? Folks, let's put this in plain English. They're not sure whether the stretcher on which they found the bullet was Governor Conley's stretcher. Understand, 
that drops the odds by at least 50 percent let's go one step further you know it's taken years and I mean years for records to be declassified now understand we know that Daryl Tomlinson according to his testimony sees this bullet on a stretcher. He believes it was stretcher A, not stretcher B. He alerts O.F. Wright and gives O.F. Wright the bullet. O.F. Wright later gives it to Richard Johnson, one of the Secret Service agents. Johnson then shows the bullet to Gerald Bent, the head of the Secret Service's White House detail. Now, either Johnson or Ben, and we aren't sure which one, folks, hands the bullet to James Rowley, the chief of the Secret Service. Right? Then, of course, Rowley gives the bullet to Elmer Todd of the FBI who then initials the bullet and gives it to Robert Fraser of the FBI laboratory. Right, so understand, after Daryl Tomlinson finds this bullet on either stretcher A or stretcher B, several people touch the bullet. It doesn't get initialed until Elmer Todd initials the bullet. That's after it's been handled by Daryl Tomlinson, O.P. Wright, Richard Johnson, Gerald Ben, James Rowley. Now, would it shock you to learn that years after the assassination, an FBI memo dated June the 20th, 1964, right? This was not declassified in the 1960s. This is years later. This memo from the FBI gets declassified. And the memo states... Neither Daryl C. Tomlinson, right, nor O.P. Wright can identify bullet. The guy who found the bullet, when shown the bullet later, could not identify the bullet as the one he found, nor could the guy he gave it to. Now, folks, it gets even worse than that. Johnson, who also handled the bullet, could not identify the bullet. Rowley, who later gets handed the bullet, could not identify the bullet. Let me ask a simple question. Had Oswald lived, wouldn't this have hurt the prosecution's case in court? Let me also say too, and I'll handle this in another video because the evidence there is a rich vein. The fact that the bullet is pristine and that the FBI did tests and none of the bullets ended up looking like this bullet after going through human cadavers and here this magic bullet is supposed to have gone through Kennedy and Connolly right let's just say that a jury could have found the story that this pristine bullet with this, we'll call it 
uncertain chain of custody might not have been the magic bullet. Right? Even if you believe the magic bullet theory, if you overlook Connolly clearly holding his Stetson, even if he's sitting off at an angle from Kennedy, he's clearly holding his Stetson over here with the wrist that gets shattered after the bullet passes through Kennedy, right? As Connolly turns around, look at his hand. Right? Understand, too, this bullet ends up in Connolly's thigh and supposedly drops out where Tomlinson finds it on one of two stretchers. Right? A jury could have found this story to just be unreliable. Well, understand. This story concerning the magic bullet, CE399, is literally the linchpin of the Warren Commission report. Right? This is the evidence they're using to trump Connolly's own recollection that he's hit with a different bullet. Right? He hears the president behind him. Then Connolly's recollection is he's hit with a different bullet. Understand, too, some pundits, Gerald Posner, Vincent Bugliosi, both talk about how the fact that the magic bullet came from Oswald's rifle Right? Without any real proof that Oswald is on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Right? Because there are no witnesses who see Oswald fire the rifle. In fact, it's worse than that. There are witnesses who see somebody else fire the rifle. Understand, there are people outside the building who look up at the sixth floor. We don't have photos of the gunman leaning out the sixth floor. But you have different people on the street who see the gunman in action. Right? Overlooking the fact that Oswald might not have been the shooter. You've had pundits afterwards talk about how the fact that this bullet with this spotty chain of custody came from Oswald's rifle and so Oswald must be guilty. Folks, the eyewitness testimony of the actual shooter, right, the fact that Howard Brennan couldn't pick Oswald out of a lineup renders the Oswald on the sixth floor part of the equation shaky at best. Then the fact that this pristine bullet, which couldn't be duplicated when bullets were shot through cadavers, right, could not be duplicated. The bullets were all deformed, right? They're hitting hard muscle. They're hitting bone, right? The fact that this bullet, is found at Parkland in pristine condition and we can't even know with any degree of certainty what stretcher it came from. Right? Not only that, at least four of the people who handled the bullet can't even identify the bullet. Let me just say, it's an outrage. Let me point out to that an investigator, Hosea Thompson, who wrote a book on the assassination, actually interviews O.P. Wright, the person who receives the bullet 
from Daryl Tomlinson, whose testimony is in the Warren Commission portions I cited earlier. And it's interesting. It's not that Wright says he doesn't remember whether it's the bullet. No, he actually says that the bullet he received had a pointed tip and that CE399 was not that bullet. Right? And so, folks, I know the language used in the Warren Commission's findings sounds conclusive. It's anything but. Right? Again, for the researchers, it's volume six of the Warren Commission report, pages 130 to 133. Arlen Specter, the author of the Magic Bullet Theory, the former Senator of Pennsylvania, he would go on to be Senator from Pennsylvania, interviews the guy who found the bullet. The testimony is so shaky, it's so thin, that it should lead all of us to question whether this bullet was the actual bullet that hit JFK and Connolly, whether this bullet was even on Stretcher A, which Tomlinson believes, or Stretcher B, which Spectre seems to be trying to get him to say whether this bullet was the pointy-nosed bullet that O.P. Wright received from Tomlinson. Keep in mind, neither of them, neither of them, according to a June 20th, 1964 FBI memo, could identify CE-399 as the bullet found at Parkland Hospital. Right, folks? The Kennedy assassination findings are filled with speculation and conjecture. This magic bullet found at Parkland and the questionable chain of custody where several people can't even identify the bullet later should raise red flags. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Let me also say too, for those of you who want to read portions of the Warren Commission hearings, there's an excellent site online. It's Mary Farrell Foundation's transcripts. I would encourage you to look at them. Maybe these hearings were accepted by the public, or at least a major portion of the public, in the 1960s. They don't make the grade by 2020 standards, or 2021 standards. That's how I see it. I look forward to your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. I thank you for stopping by.